the city can be described as a concrete jungle, where the towering skyscrapers represent the trees and the bustling crowds of people below resemble the animals that inhabit a real jungle. The city is a hub of activity, with businesses and communities flourishing through commerce. It's a place where people come to chase their dreams, hoping to find success and happiness. Sometimes the city can be harsh and unforgiving, leaving individuals feeling lost and alone in the midst of the chaos. Despite this, many still believe that the city is a land of opportunity and are willing to take the risk in pursuit of their dreams. Sometimes, though, our dreams become our nightmares. Over the course of American history, there have been a lot of great injustices brought about upon the black community. But while most of these have been well documented, one of the worst examples may not be so familiar to people as it's rarely talked about in schools or in the media. It's all the more shocking when you take into account the fact that by the time it was over, more than 800 people had been hospitalized, with as many as 300 of them being dead. In the early 20th century, segregation was still alive and well in the southern United States, and this understandably created a very tense racial atmosphere. After all, slavery had only been abolished a few decades prior, so many of those former slave owners were still around. On top of that, African Americans still had very limited rights on account of Jim Crow laws. Despite that, there was a place in Oklahoma where black people had been able to, against all odds, carve out a safe haven for themselves. It all started in 1906, when wealthy black landowner O.W. Gurley purchased 40 acres in Tulsa and renamed the area Greenwood. Why is that so important? Well, it was a location where emancipated slaves were able to live together in peace, without worry of being judged or sneered at by the former slave owners who still surrounded them. As the years went on, the area transformed itself into a place where black people could thrive, and this was evident in the community they built there, one that was completely self-sustaining and featured locally owned grocery stores, banks, restaurants, and doctor's offices, amongst other things. So much did the area prosper, it came to be informally known amongst the locals as Black Wall Street on account of how successful those living there generally were. Of course, this didn't sit well with certain pockets of the white population as they instead saw such a place as a threat to their own superiority. In post-World War I, there had been an increase in racial tensions, particularly throughout the Deep South. This, combined with the release of D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation in 1915, was largely responsible for the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, a white supremacist group which had been active en masse since the 1870s. That activity led to a whole host of racially motivated violence taking place throughout the latter half of the 1910s and beyond, with violent acts including but not being limited to assault, property damage, and lynching. With all this swirling in the atmosphere, it's easy to see why Black Wall Street was a powder keg waiting to be ignited. After all, many of the Ku Klux Klan members who saw themselves as racially superior were struggling financially and so, to their warped perspectives, seeing their black counterparts thriving must have felt like an affront to the natural order. All it needed, then, was a spark to ignite things. A spark which eventually came on May 30th, 1921, when a 19-year-old black shoeshiner named Dick Rowland entered an elevator at the Drexel Building at 319 South Main Street, a location not far from Greenwood. As for what he was doing there, well, he needed to use the colored-only restroom on the top floor as it was the only one nearby. Also in the elevator at the time, however, was a 17-year-old white elevator operator by the name of Sarah Page, and this was where the problem occurred. 
Now, what the relationship between the two was prior to that meeting is unclear. It's been suggested by some that they may have been romantically involved. Though if that were the case, it would have obviously been kept as quiet as possible. Others, meanwhile, argued that while the two were not as close as that, they were at least familiar, if not altogether friendly with each other. That was because Dick would have ridden that elevator on a regular basis in order to access the bathroom at the top floor. Either way, on this fateful day, as the doors closed, a clerk at the nearby Renberg's department store heard a young woman scream and while heading over to investigate, the clerk would not only catch sight of a young black man rushing from the building, but they would also find Sarah, still in the elevator, in a distraught state. Seeing what they felt was a clear case of a black man assaulting a white woman, the clerk immediately alerted the authorities who took the young girl in for questioning. Not that Sarah was necessarily on board with that, though. No, while no written account of the statement she gave to the police has ever been found, it's believed she actually downplayed the whole incident at the time, explaining it away as Dick having grabbed her arm in an attempt to stop himself from tripping and falling, and nothing more. In fact, so sure was she that nothing serious had occurred, she refused to press any charges. This led to the police filing the whole thing away as a mere argument between two teenagers. Still, even if the alleged victim was claiming nothing criminal had happened, the police wanted to bring Dick in for questioning anyway, a sign of just what the racial dynamics were like at the time. That's right, whether or not an assault had occurred, Dick Rowland now had to watch his back because, with mob justice being a common occurrence at the time, there was every possibility someone was going to come for him once the story got out to the public. That was why, realizing the gravity of the situation, he fled to his mother's house in the nearby Greenwood neighborhood. Of course, that was also exactly where Henry Carmichael and Henry C. Pack, a white detective and a black patrolman respectively, found him the following day on Tuesday, May 31st. That was far from Dick's biggest problem by now, though, because, after news of the incident had somehow leaked to the media, a story was published in the Tulsa Tribune claiming Sarah had been the victim of an attempted rape at the hands of a young black male. Feeling like justice needed to be served, the paper led a call to action, arguing in an editorial piece for the perpetrator to be lynched. Needless to say, this riled up the local white populace, particularly those who were already inclined to dislike their black counterparts. So, with fears over his safety growing, the authorities had to move Dick from the Tulsa City Jail at the corner of 1st Street and Main Street to a more secure location on the top floor of the Tulsa County Courthouse before the day was done. But that did little to quell the growing outrage because, with the sensationalized version of the story now being public knowledge, local white residents began converging upon the courthouse at around 4 p.m. That continued until, less than four hours later, a mob of several hundred people were there, each of them calling for the blood of Dick Rowland. Understandably then, not wanting another situation like the one that occurred a year prior when white murder suspect Roy Belton was lynched, Tulsa County Sheriff Willard M. McCullough ordered his deputies to enter a defensive formation in preparation of a potential riot. With those preparations made, he ventured outside and spoke to the bang crowd in a last gasp attempt to convince them to go home. But despite his attempts, the mob was already too thirsty for vengeance and that's why they would reportedly hoot him down. Would things have been different had he actually explained the truth behind the situation, that no assault had taken place? Maybe, but maybe he believed the crowd were too far gone to hear that and that trying to tell them no crime had occurred would only rile them up more. Either way, what came next set things off completely as, at around 8.20 p.m., three white men entered the courthouse and demanded the accused be turned over. Of course, knowing full well what these men intended to do with Dick, Sheriff McCullough refused any such demands and sent them back outside. Meanwhile, as this was happening, a few blocks away on Greenwood Avenue, black community members had gathered to discuss the situation. As far as they saw it, they couldn't allow this young man to be lynched and so something had to be done to stop the mob before it got to such a point. 
they were unable to reach a consensus on what tactics should be used to achieve that goal. That was because, while some of the younger men, many of them World War I veterans, argued that they should take up arms and fight the white mob off, other older, more prosperous members of the community didn't want to go down that path for fear it would lead to extensive damage, including the destruction of their own businesses. In the end, it was the former that appeared to win out, and at around 9.30 p.m., approximately 60 black men armed with rifles and shotguns arrived at the courthouse to support the accused boy. While this was a move which was officially decried by the authorities after the fact, the local black community later claimed that they were actually told to come by Sheriff McCullough, presumably under the belief they'd act as a suitable deterrent to the rising mob. As should have probably been obvious, though, that ended up having the opposite effect. After seeing the men arrive with weapons in tow, many of the white protesters returned home to collect their own guns, and when it came to those who didn't live close enough, they started making their way over to the nearby National Guard Armory at the corner of 6th Street and Norfolk Avenue where they hoped to find something to arm themselves with. Realizing there was a potential for a serious altercation, Major James Bell of the 180th Infantry Regiment, who was posted at the armory, ordered all of his men to prepare for a break-in. When the angry mob arrived soon thereafter and began trying to force their way inside, he was quick to inform them that if they continued on in such a manner, his men were under orders to use lethal force. Thankfully, that was enough to make them reconsider as the crowd of around 400 dispersed. But that didn't mean the danger was over entirely because, back at the courthouse, the numbers had swollen to almost 2,000, with many of those people being ready to kill. At this point, it was just a matter of time until someone fired the first shot and the whole powder keg was set off. As to who drew first blood, though, well, that's never fully come to light. According to a 2001 Oklahoma commission on the incident, after a further 75 armed African-American men arrived on the scene at around 10 p.m., a white man attempted to disarm one of them, with this leading to a scuffle and then, in the words of the sheriff himself, quote, all hell broke loose. But that's not the only possible origin point of what came next. No, a first-hand account from Eloise Taylor Butler, someone who would have been 19 at the time, argues that it was actually a group of six white males attacking a lone black man down the street from the courthouse which caused local shopkeepers to come out and fire the first shots in his defense. Whatever happened, the end result was the same. Over the course of the rest of the night and into the early hours of Wednesday morning, a full-scale riot broke out as each side took to squaring off in gunfights. It wasn't just the men who initially gathered at the courthouse who were caught up in the battle either. No, pretty soon, passengers on an incoming train from Muskogee were forced to take cover after a rumor began circulating that they were brought in as reinforcements. Even further out from Greenwood, in the more middle-class areas of the city, white families who employed African Americans as help were being accosted by rioters, with them demanding the black staff be handed over so they could be dealt with in a presumably lethal way. When some of those families refused such an advance, they found their properties being vandalized as they themselves got caught in a wave of destruction. That destruction was nothing compared to what was going on over at Black Wall Street as there, at around 1 a.m., a group of white men began driving around Archer Street throwing Molotov cocktails through shop windows. When the Tulsa Fire Department arrived to try to combat the fires which took hold as a result, they were turned away at gunpoint by the rioters. Of course, this left the owners of these businesses, as well as the other black people living in the area, with two choices stay and fight, or flee with their lives. Seeing how bad things were getting, many chose the latter option as a mass exodus of the city started to take place. Meanwhile, for those who remained, the destruction was only getting started. In fact, by 4 a.m., things had gotten so bad that an estimated two dozen black-owned businesses in the area had been destroyed by means of arson. On top of that, the deaths were piling up high. And this aspect only got worse when, an hour later, the sound of a train whistle was mistaken as a signal for white rioters to launch an all-out ground offensive on Greenwood. 
By this time, it was clear that military intervention was going to be required in order to calm things down. But when such intervention arrived soon after, it wasn't coming with the intention of helping the local African American community. No, in perhaps the most shocking part of the entire incident, numerous eyewitnesses would describe seeing at least a dozen planes carrying white assailants dropping firebombs onto not just local homes and office buildings, but also fleeing families as well. According to other eyewitness reports, machine gun fire could be heard coming from the planes as well, suggesting they were under orders to gun down those they couldn't hit with a direct strike. Why would the authorities take such action? Well, according to a later statement from law enforcement officials, while they didn't confirm the existence of any firebombs being dropped, they did admit that planes were flown over Greenwood with the attention of providing reconnaissance and protecting against a potential quote-unquote Negro uprising. Yep, the black community were already taking the full brunt of the blame for the massacre. So much so that once martial law was declared and the National Guard was brought in on a ground level, they immediately went through the city rounding up African Americans and moving them over to nearby internment camps. Even if this did soon bring the riots to an end, it didn't answer the question as to why the victims were being treated as the aggressors. Hell, even the fact that it was officially referred to as a riot instead of a massacre afterwards felt like a coded way of blaming the people of Black Wall Street. That just doesn't tie into the reality of the situation. A reality which was that an angry white mob sought to kill a young black boy for something he hadn't been convicted of doing, and then ended up taking out their vengeance on the entire African American community instead. Once this vengeance had been exhausted, as many as 300 people had died, with the majority of them being members of the local black community. And these numbers weren't just pulled out of thin air either. No, they were backed up not only in the 2001 Oklahoma Commission, but also the Red Cross. Though the latter group admitted getting an exact number was near impossible as many of the dead had been hastily buried in mass graves in an undocumented fashion after the fact. But it wasn't just the death toll that was a tragedy. As a result of the mass property damage that occurred, Black Wall Street was pretty much wiped off the map. In fact, a reported 60 businesses and 1,256 homes were burned down during the riots, with this leading to 10,000 citizens of Greenwood being left homeless and forced to remain in internment camps for months thereafter. What's more, none of these people received any financial assistance when it came time to rebuild, meaning they had to start all over again from scratch. Even when a few filed insurance claims down the line, they were largely turned away on account of riot clauses built into the contracts. It truly was one of the worst massacres in American history and arguably the worst case of racial terrorism seen on U.S. soil since the days of slavery but it wouldn't be one which remained in the public consciousness for long. Over the years and decades that followed, the entire incident was largely swept under the rug. After the subsequent 1921 grand jury investigation effectively absolved the authorities of any wrongdoing and put the blame squarely on the local African American community instead, the media ceased to report on the incident at all. Even history books would largely omit the Tulsa Race Massacre when looking back on the time period and schools wouldn't teach children about it. So it's no surprise that for decades, even if Black Wall Street was largely rebuilt in the years which followed, most were unaware that such a horrific event had taken place there. Sure, some did their best to keep the story alive so that it could remain remembered for what it was. A dark day in American history where a marginalized yet thriving community was set back by decades. But this proved to be difficult on a grand scale as most apparently wanted to whitewash it from history. Luckily though, the likes of the aforementioned 2001 Oklahoma Commission, combined with popular TV shows such as HBO's Watchmen and Lovecraft Country using the massacre as key plot points, have allowed this event to return to the public eye in recent years. Because of that, not only have there been increased calls to get proper financial restitution for the survivors and the families of the deceased, but on June 1st, 2021, President Joe Biden himself acknowledged the injustice of the incident by visiting Tulsa on the 100th anniversary of the massacre and stating that, quote, 
Some injustices are so heinous, so horrific, so grievous, they cannot be buried, no matter how hard people try. Not only is the Tulsa Race Massacre a prime example of racism leading to generational destruction in the black community, but it's also an example of how we often like to forget about such things as they're uncomfortable to address, especially given how far we like to think we've come. But we shouldn't forget it, because it's still having effects on the people of Tulsa to this day. In fact, as a result of new laws and construction standards that were put in place in the years following the massacre, many African Americans couldn't afford to get loans or rebuild themselves. Because of that, there was a severe decline in black homeownership, something that had a ripple effect across the subsequent generations. On top of that, according to a study carried out by Alex Albright during the 1940s, the aftermath of the incident also led to black citizens in Tulsa finding it more difficult to get jobs or achieve a higher level of education, likely on account of the stigma around them being blamed for the events of 1921. That's led to a situation where today, only a few black-owned businesses remain on what was once the mighty Black Wall Street. Still, at least it's no longer forgotten to history anymore, and we can all now keep it alive in everyone's minds. Not because it deserves to be celebrated, of course, but because it serves as a constant reminder that there's always more work to be done when it comes to combating racism. After all, if we don't want to make the same mistakes again in the future, we can never lose sight of what happened in our past. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week when we'll take you somewhere sinister.